few motivations for writing the book. Uh, number one is I love self-help books in the intellectual circles I'm running in. It's kind of uncool to love self-help. You're supposed to like history and philosophy and theory, you know, uh, maybe novels. But uh, if you looked at my Amazon Kindle, it would just be filled with how to be happier, how to be more successful, uh, how to date better when I was single, uh, all these these books. But as much as I love self-help, as much as I'm a common connoisseur of self-help, I'm kind of disappointed when I read a lot of these books in that I don't feel like the evidence reaches the standards. I, as a data scientist, have, you know, expect that, you know, expect they should reach. And uh, they kind of feel a little wishy-washy. They tell you something, if you feel good for a few seconds, I'm like, wait, what is that based on? Or even when they quote a study, it seems like they have an idea and then they just find a study to defend it. And you can find a study to defend any idea you want. Like there's so many studies, you can find a cherry pick study, a bad study. Uh, it's And so I was kind of like, what happens if I just spend like a few years really reading uh, all kinds of studies on these big topics that I'm interested in, then that kind of everybody's interested in uh, and just say, these are the best, this is the best evidence on the, these topics. Uh, so it's kind of, I, I call it a self-help for data geeks. Uh, and it's, I think a good principle for writing, uh, if there are any writers, potential writers following along is write the book you want to read. And that was definitely how I approached this. And the other motivation for this book is that I'm a huge baseball fan. Who used New York Mets fan? I was a huge baseball fan as a kid. Uh, and any baseball fan knows that the game has been transformed by analytics. Uh, so th it's a totally different game than when I was a kid. Some people think it's been ruined by analytics uh, because the analytics are almost too good. They put the infielders in places where it's impossible for the hitter, really difficult for the hitter to get a hit. The analytics revolution was discussed in Michael Lewis's book, Moneyball, in the movie Moneyball. Uh, but when you think of the big decisions in our lives, like how we date, who we marry, uh, how we parent, uh, you know, how we spend our time, how we pick a career, I would argue, and I think you'd have to agree, that most people basically use your gut, use their gut. Uh, you kind of just like, you talk to a few people, you get some advice, you maybe read some of these self-help books that aren't based, based on very much. And then you kind of just say, yeah, I'll do this. It feels about right. And I'm like, well, what happens if you instead actually took a money ball for your life approach to these decisions? So that was the motivation. And don't trust your gut is kind of the result of, of, of this motivation. Uh, the self-help book that I wish existed. There are all kinds of things that surprised me. And I think the biggest surprising thing was just how much new research that I didn't know about. And this research that was kind of like wishy-washy is now so much less wishy-washy. I mean, I talk about, uh, I have this chapter, the AI marriage. I talk about this study, Samantha Joel and 85 other scientists uh, where they collected data on 11,000 couples and like hundreds of variables on every, they knew everything about every, everybody, like what their hobbies are, what their political views are, what their backgrounds are. And then they use the most advanced machine learning, these random forest models. And they're like, what predicts a happy marriage? And I'm like, that is so cool. That's the question. Like, it's so almost the, the number one, arguably the most important question in life. Like uh, what predicts people are happy in relationships? Uh, and it kind of had a little bit of a, a, a twist is that, uh, the, I think the main lesson there, there, there's some subtleties, but the main lesson is that mar is that happiness in relationships is incredibly hard to predict. And the predictive power is way lower than you'd expect, which when you actually think about it really changes how you should approach, uh, looking for a mate in, in ways I discuss in the book. There's the, these projects that started all, only a few years ago, they only could be done because of new te recent technology, the iPhone, where they ping people at different times during the day. And they say, what are you doing? Uh, how, ha who are you with and how happy are you? So my favorite of them is this mappiness project by Susanna Murado and George McCarran, and they have 3 million data points. So it's not like a hundred data points, it's 3 million. And it's just like, they, they've done all these incredible stuff. I think revolutionized our understanding of happiness sometimes in like just quirky ways. One of the, their, my favorite studies of this mappiness project uh, is that they follow sports fans happiness during, before, during, and after a sporting event of the team. And basically if your team loses, you lose eight points, you get eight points of pain and if your team wins, you get four points of happiness. 
uh, much less. So on average, basically sports fans are making a bad, a bad deal. But the major lesson I took from these studies, a, a lot of these studies, I was like describing them to my friends. I was obsessed with them. I get, I was getting so excited. I'm like, you'll never believe like how much nature improves happiness, or you'll never believe like how much being in a beautiful environment improves happiness, or you'll never believe the activities that make people happier, like how much friendship matters for happiness. You tell people these things and it's like, no, duh, which is sometimes I people respond to a lot of research. But then I thought about it and I'm like, you know, all my friends who are saying these things are obvious. If I look at how they spend their days or how they live their lives, they're doing none of the obvious things that make people happy. Most of them live in cities. They're not spending time in nature. They live in like, they don't decorate their environments. They live in ugly surroundings, which makes people miserable. Uh, they work all the time. Work's the second most miserable activity. The only most more miserable one is being sick in bed, according to Bryson and McCarran. They spend very little time with their friends because they're so busy at work. Uh, so it, the obviousness of the happiness research is profound. And it just says like all these things you're chasing don't make people happy. And the things that make people happy are incredibly simple. And I end the book with the data-driven answer to life. And anybody who's unhappy, I kind of ask them, what percent of your day are you doing things like the close to the data-driven answer to life? And what percent of day are you not? And actually I did my own study. Bryce and McCarran found 40, ranked 40 activities on how happy they are. And I worked with Spencer Greenberg, where we just asked people, basically, how happy do you think each of these activities make people? And there are all these activities that people overrate the happiness of, of and underrate the happiness of. And then the other thing that we we've, that, that, that we found is that over time, people, if anything, are spending less time doing the activities that make people happy. Uh, so, you know, we've, the, the country's gotten richer and richer, and people are spending less time doing happy activities. And that's one of the reasons that as uh, ha as the country has gotten richer, happiness has remained flat or even dropped. So luck's a really important factor in life. I talk about art a lot because there are all these cool studies on art. Any successful artist, any successful piece of art, and you see enormous amounts of luck. The Mona Lisa was just a normal painting in the Louvre, and then it was stolen one day, and it became like this worldwide story of who stole the Mona Lisa. Uh, and it, like overnight, it was the most famous painting in the world. And everyone's like, this painting's amazing. And now the same painting, everyone's analyzing why it's the best painting ever drawn. It was just a total lucky thing. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of luck, but then in aggregate over the course of a lifetime, the studies show there are definitely ways you can dramatically improve your luck. Uh, there's this really cool study uh, by Sam Freiberger and others where they study successful painters over time. And they say that there's basically one thing that distinguishes people who make it in painting and people who don't. It's what they call a relentless and exhaustive search for your break. So basically some painters, they just present their art at the same place over and over again and hope that someone will find them. And then other painters are traveling everywhere and eventually they stumble on some gallery that they would have never expected that gives them some huge break. And then after the fact, you say, oh, they got really luckier. They're no better than that other painter who didn't make it. They're like, well, actually they did all these things that made them luckier. And there are also these really cool studies that uh, in many fields, there's this relationship between quantity and outcome. So kind of the more you do something, the more luck chances you get to get lucky. And that's true in art as well, that artists that just produce more work have more success in part because you have more opportunity for to get your lucky break. So putting more out, out there in the world is kind of a way to get luckier. Uh, there are kind of these secrets to get luckier uh, rather than just whining about luck. You know, I, I do, I kind of hate going against whining because whining is definitely my preferred life strategy. Uh, but uh, I definitely do think the data shows that there's a reason that some people seem so much luckier than others. There's this study recently on the age of successful entrepreneurs, and I found the median age of successful entrepreneurs is 42 years old. And that's true in even arenas such as tech, uh, where people think that it goes against a lot of people's intuition that successful entrepreneurs are in college, they're 20 year olds, 25 year olds. And this is pretty shocking. The age of success in business increases all the way up until the age of 60. Uh, and I think 60 year olds have about three times the chance of success as 30 year olds, uh, which all these facts go against a lot of uh, kind of conventional wisdom. And I think part of the reason for that is because young entrepreneurs they get so much attention in part because it's initially counterintuitive. You're like someone built an empire in their 
uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg builds an empire at the age of 19 from his dorm room. That's so cool. Hollywood makes a movie about it. And uh, everyone's like, and then the movie gets made or the story gets told. And everyone's like, oh, that's really common. And then you look at the data and you're like, no, no, no. Actually, that weird thing that and now everyone thinks is normal is actually totally abnormal. These great stories capture our attention and we uh, overemphasize their prevalence. And uh, when you look at the data, you frequently see that the story is unrepresentative. The ac- anecdote is unrepresentative. How many 40 year olds don't, don't start a business because they're like, my chance of entrepreneurship is over. Probably tons. Uh, and the data actually says, no, you're 40, you're 50, you're 55, you're 60. You still could start a successful business. You have a better chance than if you were uh, 25, 30. Uh, so like uh, the data, some of these uh, kind of pernicious uh, ideas come from these uh, unrepresentative stories that the data can help us overthrow. I was reading a paper by two friends of mine from an economics PhD program and a couple other researchers uh, where they studied the entire universe, de-identifying anonymous data from tax records. And they had data on everybody in the top 1% or top 0.1% of incomes in the United States. And they said, okay, who are the rich people in the United States? And they have this sentence that just blew my head open. And they go, the typical rich American is the owner of a mid-sized regional business such as an auto dealership or a beverage distribution company. And I go, what the heck? First of all, I don't know about you. I didn't even know what a beverage distribution company is, <laughs> uh, was. Uh, second of all, when I thought of a rich person, my the first person who jumped into mind wasn't an auto dealer owner. You think of a CEO, you're thinking of a, a rap star, or an athlete. Like they're just all these like crazy ideas. So what can we learn this? And I, one of the things we learn is the value of owning versus wages. So uh, there's a fun fact, actually, uh, that points the value of owning versus wages. Uh, The the richest NFL player in history, National Football League player in history, is not the best player, not Jerry Rice, not Joe Montana, uh, not even Tom Brady. It's Jerry Richardson, this guy who caught 15 passes, had a very brief career, and then retired and started buying up uh, Hardee's franchises and owned them and became a billionaire to the point he eventually bought the Carolina Panthers. Uh, So that shows the value of owning versus salaries. But then within owning, there are like huge differences by fields. So certain fields are just horrible businesses. And one of the things is that any business that you, that like is sexy may very well be horrible. So there's this study of the, how quickly the average business in a field goes out of business. And for a dentist, it's like 19 years. The average person starts a dentist's office, you're going to last on average 19 years, uh, almost two decades, make a good solid living over those 19 years. In record stores is the shortest single one, it was 2.5 years. Uh, Other ones like toy stores, beauty supply stores, uh, clothing stores, they're just awful. Like they're just out of business within two, three years, four years. Like it's just, everybody wants to do it. The competition's ferocious. Uh, but then, so, so like, so kind of something that's a little more boring, like uh, beverage distribution or auto dealership, probably a little better, but then, uh, like that's kind of necessary, but almost not sufficient condition because, uh, there are all these boring businesses where you look at the data, they're not making many millionaires. And there's a whole chart of how many people in the top 0.1%, top 1% from different fields. And there are all these fields that have tons of businesses and basically nobody's in the top 1%, top 0.1%. So uh, pest cleaners or carpentry businesses or uh, a, a, a million other businesses. And the problem is they're getting killed by competition. Uh, and basically, if you have a business, as soon as you have any profit, somebody else is just going to come in, start a business and take away all your profits. So you need some way to block that. And that's where auto dealership kind of is so powerful that they're basically legally protected local monopolies. There are all these laws about who can start an auto dealership. And once you have an auto dealership, uh, you basically have this protection against other people starting their auto dealerships. And uh, and the other fields, they may not be legally protected, but they basically have something. I talk about don't trust your gut. There are all these examples. But basically, there's a, a thought process you can go through of are you 
what's preventing you from someone else from just coming in and taking all your profits. And so you want to own something where someone can't take away your profits, uh, which again, not rocket science, but just if you literally have those two questions, you're way ahead everybody else of getting rich. Cause a lot of people just don't understand those two simple questions uh, that, that really will help you uh, in, in your path to uh, being well, wealthy. My book has the provocative title, Don't Trust Your Gut. My last book was called Everybody Lies. Uh, you know, one thing that either my gut or maybe some data shows is that titles have to grab people's attention. So, uh, so I didn't, uh, so, you know, the, the most more accurate uh, idea for my book, maybe, uh, you know, your gut can be reliable, but you should know data on uh, different topics to kind of help you in making decisions and don't just wing it like most of us do. I think here's some data that can help you in making decisions isn't quite as provocative as don't trust your gut. I don't want people to read my book and say, I, I can't use my gut ever to make a decision or I always need to know the data. I'm just pointing to people out that there's more data out there that ever, has ever existed. Uh, and sometimes the data really does go against what you think and kind of this approach of winging it uh, in life just isn't the best one. A great example, if you're 40 and you think you're too old to start a business, well, look at the data on who actually starts businesses and uh, rethink that assumption. Uh, if you are a huge music fan and think now's the time to quit your job and start a record business, like at least know the data that record businesses are the quickest to go out of business. Just know the data. I'm not saying you, you have to follow it 100%, but just know that data. Even just Googling around uh, for data yourself, like it's just a different method of making decisions. Like what's actually the data on this topic? When you're suffering from a health problem, when I was like in my 20s, I just go to a doctor and do whatever they told, they told me. And now there are actually studies that algorithms are better than doctors on many big decisions. So now when I go to a doctor, I like read up on studies and try to find, okay, what's actually most likely. And so it's basically just being more informed of the power of data, uh, and, and using the data available at your fingertips, uh, to help you make decisions, <laughs> which is the point of my book. Uh, and that's not another great example, uh, where for years we've been relying on our gut and like just old wives tales of how to get rid of hiccups. Uh, and now for now, I no longer support that approach. And I think that and my guess is if I do a deep dive into the literature, there will be somewhere better information on how to get rid of hiccups.